listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to www.nakedbibleblog.com. Welcome back to the Naked Bible Podcast. We're going to shift gears in the podcast now. We've spent a lot of time talking about interpreting Scripture in light of its own context. And we talked about worldview context and lots of historical backgrounds and becoming acquainted with ancient literature. Again, that helps us think the writer's thoughts after him, helps us sort of recapture mentally uh, the worldview of the biblical writer to, so we can partake in the intellectual tradition that was going on around him, the intellectual source material that really formed his world, his worldview. So we, we spent a lot of time talking about that and resources for doing that. And then in this series on interpreting the Bible in light of its own context, we shifted into literary contexts, different genres. Uh, That was all a precursor to what we're going to embark on today, and that is we're going to get into words, really word-level meaning, working in the text at the word level, uh, specifically interpreting the words that we read in a given passage. Now, this is going to be sort of a precursor episode, something that will set up Uh, the next few episodes in the series. So take it for what it is. Just by way of introduction, I want to start you thinking about the kinds of things that we sort of assume that may not really be true or may not really be uh, good thinking when it comes to studying words, studying the the, the text, the words of Scripture, and also to start thinking about the, the stuff that we will make us better thinkers uh, that you know we do need to consider and things we need to do to get things right when it comes to interpreting words doing word studies and i think you can already tell i'm going to go beyond what people uh, traditionally think of as word studies uh, i think it while it's good uh, people using things like strong's concordance to do quote unquote word studies it's actually pretty primitive pretty simplistic Uh, Really, uh, the pejorative term would be shallow, but I don't want to be pejorative here because I remember uh, in my own personal Bible study that when I finished reading the Bible once or twice, the the very first thing I bought after that was a Strong's Concordance. Someone told me that was what I needed to do, and it it was a great tool. I mean, for where I was at the time, that was just something that I really benefited a lot from. But the problem is, uh, today, we have a lot of pastors who are, that's what they use. They're using Strong's Concordance to do word study in preparation for sermons. I mean, this is something a lay person uh, should be doing. And really, for my money, I think lay people uh, are a lot, are capable of so much more uh, that they should be graduating from Strong's kind of material pretty quickly. But the reality is that they don't. And even people that who occupy our pulpits are using tools like this that are really, uh, really subpar. And it's not just an issue of tools. It's an issue of, of thinking well about what you're actually trying to do uh, when we think of word studies. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it goes beyond looking something up in a dictionary or a lexicon. Grammar matters for meaning, and a host of other things matter for meaning. And so when I talk about studying words, yes, I'm going to be talking about and doing some things that, that might remind you of this thing other people call word studies, but it's just a lot bigger than that. It's a lot broader than that. And so, again, by way of introduction, I want to sort of prep you to, to, to help you see the problems and really, if you're familiar with sort of, you know, word studies as people know it, as, as it's known today, again, using things like Strong's Concordance and looking things up and by Strong's numbers, and then you get a list of possible meanings, and that's it. That's your word study. You know, pick one. Um, this is going to go well beyond that. Uh, And I want to talk about word fallacies. I want to talk about mistakes that are made. I want to talk about just errors in thinking. And so by way of getting started down that road, and we're going to be spending a few podcast episodes on this whole issue, I want you to consider a few uh, introductory thoughts uh, in this episode. Thought number one would be that words mean nothing by themselves. Words just 
they literally don't mean anything. To illustrate this, visualize in your mind. If if I if you were sitting here with me at, at a computer screen or we were in a classroom and I had a I was at a, a whiteboard and I wrote the word R U N, the word run on the board. And I turned to you and I asked you, what does that mean? What would you say? Well, it wouldn't take long to realize that, frankly, the possibilities are just myriad. Uh, you really don't know what it means because you don't have any sort of context for it. It's just sitting there by itself. R U N run. And, and I'm asking you, what does that mean? And frankly, as you stare at it, as you think about it now, it doesn't mean anything because it could mean practically anything. Uh, for instance, if you looked up run in a dictionary, if you assumed and see, so you don't even know if it's a noun or a verb. If you assumed it was a noun, what you're going to actually find is close to 20 different meanings just for the noun. Let me give you a few. Uh, run could be a score in a baseball game. Okay, It could be a race, like the first run of you know some particular tournament. Okay, It could actually be a noun and not the verb. A run, if, if two years ago I, I painted my house, me and my wife did that by hand, and you know, because we're not professionals, you can walk around our house and you will see a run at certain points of the house. It's a drip, okay, a drip that's solidified, that's dried there. Is that what R-U-N means? Uh, it could be a continued series like, a, like of, a, of a book, a print run, okay, it's a series in continuous fashion of, in this case, something that's printed on paper. A run could be an animal path, uh, a dog run at a, at a rest stop or something like that. Uh, you get the idea. So even if you could assume correctly it's a noun, and you can't if it's just R-U-N out there in space or on a, on a whiteboard or on a computer screen with nothing around it, it really doesn't mean anything because it could mean almost anything. It could, there's, there's great variability. You must know certain things about that word before you can even begin to think well about it at all. If it was a verb, then you're even in more of a pickle because, again, if you go back to your Webster's Dictionary and you look up run and you consider the verbal possibilities, now you're dealing with 50 or more meanings for R-U-N. Is it something that's faster than a walk? Is it trying to win a political office to run for president? Okay. Is it is it some is it a machine that's operating? The machine is running. Okay, run that machine over there. Uh, is it something that's spreading out? Okay, it's running. Something is has run all over the table. Okay, is it something that you know involves a collision? Don't run into the wall, okay? I mean, there, there are literally 50 or so possibilities in a normal good collegiate dictionary. Just look it up for R-U-N. The word by itself means nothing. You, you, you're paralyzed by it. Okay, what you need is you need that word to appear in relationship to other words and also you need some sort of context. Now, we've been spending a lot of time talking about context, again, in the podcast. And what I hope you realize by now is that when, when I use the word context, yes, I think you do get this by now. I, I'm, I'm not referring to something current, you know, something like the context of modern evangelicalism or the Reformation or anything in the modern world. Really, when I say biblical context, interpreting the Bible in its own context, I mean interpreting the Bible in the context in which it was produced, in which it was written. Okay, we're, we're very clear on that. But have you picked up the fact that there are actually many contexts? There's a context of worldview, 
There's a religious context. There are cultural contexts. There are literary contexts. And now when you get down to the word level, there are word level contexts as well. And to know what any given word means, you must be proficient, okay? You must have developed skills. You must be competent in all of those contexts. You need to be aware of them. You need to be thinking about them. You need to have good tools to help you think about them, to build your awareness, to raise that in your mind. Uh, again, just to sort of like tools in the belt. I mean, you need to be exercised. You need to be familiar, be, be um, really through repetition, through, through doing this often enough, you need to be exercised into this is, these things just sort of come automatically to you. Uh, so that when you when you read something in scripture, you're thinking about history, worldview, culture, religion, what's the literary context, what genre, all these sorts of things should just be immediate. And now we're getting into adding to all that word level context. Now, what we usually think of as context in, in this regard, when we're, when we're trying to figure out what words mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we think of, okay, well, there I'm looking at a Bible verse and what, you know, it, it, I need to be aware of the paragraph. Okay, well, you do. That, that, that's okay. And then I need to be aware of the immediately preceding paragraph and the immediately following paragraph. And that's my context. Well, I would suggest to you that that's not wrong, but it's just extraordinarily narrow and limited. Yes, you need to know what's going on before your passage and immediately after your passage. That's true. But that's only one context, and it's actually a really tiny one, too. Uh, it says nothing about these bigger contexts that we've been talking about. Uh, for instance, beyond, you know, w without going back and you know doing all the backtracking through worldview and history and culture and religion and literary that we've been spending time with on the podcast, e even if I don't go back and rehearse all that, context in terms of the writing is actually bigger than just the paragraph before and the paragraph after. There, there's, there's the context of the author of your book. Now, in some cases, you, you're not going to know this because we don't know who wrote a particular book, but you know that a book was written and so somebody wrote it. But your word meaning might be dictated, might be guided, might really be determined by how that word is used throughout the entire work, throughout the entire book. So you might be looking at a very specific verse in John, and you might not think, again, because of, of how we're trained, and I think often trained inadequately, you might be thinking, okay, to understand what, what this word in John means, I need to look at the paragraph before, the paragraph after, kind of read through the whole chapter maybe, and now I got to make a decision. It never occurs to you that, hey, how else does John use this word in the entire book? Did John write anything else besides the Gospel of John? Well, sure he did. He wrote three letters. First, second, third John. He also wrote the book of Revelation. Okay, so how does John use the words in other books? Think of Paul. I mean, Paul wrote 13 or so books of the New Testament. And you might be looking at something in Galatians. Well, you know, Paul wrote a lot of things. So it's not just looking at the immediately preceding and the immediately following paragraph in some portion of Galatians that's going to, you know, really zero you in on the meaning of a particular word, okay, it's certainly going to contribute, but you need to be thinking bigger than that. You need to be thinking about who the author was and what else he wrote. How might, you know, did, did Paul ever use this word in this same context in another letter? Has it occurred to you to look, okay? So it, it's much wider than that. And even wider than a book, there are often cases where word meaning is determined by section of the Bible. For instance, this gets a little bit like genre, but let's say that we have, uh, you know, some large portion of scripture. Let's, let's take Joshua and Judges. Now, uh, if you read a commentary and you wrote, or you read about the introduction of the book, sort of the, what scholars think about the authorship of this book, you would, you would very quickly discern whether you're in evangelical circles or outside, that it's a pretty common assumption 
that it's believed that the same person uh, wrote Joshua and Judges, very you know close to each other. The, the same person would have would have been uh, working on that and producing both of those books. So that isn't something that is just sort of going to stick out to you because neither of the books uh, assert or state who the author is. But there are lots of good reasons to think that the same person wrote both. So if you were not aware of that, if you're trying to do a word study in Judges and you never look at how a word's used in Joshua. Uh, you you could really c uh, come out with a skewered conclusion about what's going on. So there's even a, the bigger issue uh, of whole sections of, of scripture. And even even when uh, we don't have the same author in a section, let's take the Psalms or even like one of the five books of the Psalms. Uh, you might not be aware that Psalms is divided into five books. Um, a lot of your Bibles will mark those books, but we have multiple authors in Psalms, but they're the same kind of literature. And the books are typically arranged. There, There is actually some logic to this. Again, you would know this had, had you done reading, if you were in the Psalms, trying to do a study there. If you'd read some background about the book, you would be alerted to this. Uh, well, if, if, it's, if it occurs in the first book of the Psalms, which is, you know, I think the first 42 or something like that, uh, then that might influence the way we look at the word that we're studying. Again, thinking in bigger sections. Uh, so there, there might be some specific occasion to a larger section of scripture. So right away, you know, we're, we're well beyond, you know, this again, immediately in preceding and following paragraph and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot to think about when it comes to studying words. And that's what we want to do in the next few episodes of the podcast series. So to try to summarize all this that I've just sort of rambled a little bit on, when it, we talk about understanding word meaning. We need to ask, well, what determines meaning? And the answer is context. Context is king. Context always determines meaning. But then we have to ask, well, what, is, what does that mean? What does context mean? Well, it means lots of things. There are lots of different contexts. Again, worldview, historical, cultural, religious, literary, and then you get down to the word level, and what we're going to find is that at the word level, word meaning is going to be determined by several things. And this is a little bit of a preview as to some things we'll get to in future episodes of the podcast. There is the, the form of a word. Uh, in academia, that's called morphology. The way a word is shaped or spelled actually dictates meaning. Let me give you an example in English. If I put the word C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste, on the board, for again, in our hypothetical classroom, and I asked you, hey, what does that mean? Okay, you would, you would be able to sort of parse that out a little bit, at least give me a few possibilities for chaste. Now, if I added an N to it, I changed the shape, the form of the word. Now it spells chasten. Now what does it mean? Well, it means something quite different than chaste. And all I did was add an N. Okay, I changed the shape of the word. Okay, word meaning is going to be affected by the shape, the form of a word. So we'll get into that. Word meaning, at, again, at the word level is going to be influenced by word relationships. It's a word's relationship to the words that are around it. Okay, and then we also just talked about how an author or how a section of scripture employs or uses a word. So all, all of those things, the bigger contexts, and then these word level issues, these word level contexts, all of them combine and work together to produce what we, in, the scholar would call a range of semantic possibilities for the meaning of that word, a semantic range. So there's, there's, it, it's far more complicated. It requires thinking. It's far more complicated than I'm going to look this word up in Strong's dictionary. And I look in Strong and Strong gives me four or five possibilities for what this Greek or Hebrew word means. And then what usually happens is we look at our passage, we look at Strong's list, and we sort of try to plug them in and we pick the one that we like. Okay, or we pick the one that we think you know works best. That isn't word study. What that is, is that's cherry picking a lexicon, to be bluntly honest about it. 
okay, there are many more possibilities than you're going to find in a tool like Strong's or in a lot of other tools, a lot of other lexicons, because it's very rare. Uh, again, we ha there are some exceptions to this, some modern tools that will help you, but this is kind of an exhausted process. It could take a person's whole lifetime to produce a lexicon and do all this kind of work for every word. So you're not going to escape from having to think about things, and that's a good thing, again. But we need to be able, again, to train ourselves to realizing that there's no substitute for thinking. Okay, and when we think about words, we need to be thinking about all these things we've been talking about, all these contexts. And once we do that, we will be able to develop our own range of semantic possibilities for a word using different tools, again, that will help us think, using different techniques that will help us think about a word. And we can make a more intelligent choice. We can more make a more informed choice, have a more informed understanding of what a particular word means in a particular place uh, that we're, we're trying to study, a particular passage in the Bible. So what I'm arguing for is I'm not going to give you a silver bullet that's going to give you uh, the word meaning in every passage, any given passage, but what you will learn is that there are things you can do, there are things, tools that you can use to help you think, and there are just things you need to be alerted to your awareness needs to be raised that you need to think a certain way or think about a certain issue that will help you make informed decisions as to how to interpret something you're reading. So that's our goal, again, for the next few episodes of the podcast, and I hope you'll stay with us for that. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.